Cuba is an island in the Caribbean, and as such, it might not be the first place one would necessarily associate with communism or socialism, given that the large two powers outside of Cuba that adhered to this philosophy were the Soviet Union and to some degree still today, China. The reason Cuba went down this road is because of the Cuban Revolution. And in this video, I'd like to explore why the Cuban Revolution happened, what happened and what its consequences were. Before getting into that, a quick word from today's video sponsor, which is Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a paid for video streaming service with thousands of different documentaries that you can gain access to with a small monthly fee. They cover many different topics like science, nature and history. I'd like to recommend one in particular, which is called Fidel Castro Life for the Revolution which instead of just looking at the basic historical facts of the revolution as I do here, it takes a deeper look by looking at the accounts of his life based on private letters, on the correspondence he had with others, and the speeches and interviews which he gave. So it's a really great watch and you can have access to this and many other documentaries on similar topics by going to Magellan TV. There's even a special offer for viewers of this channel. You can either go to the description or simply type try.magellantv.com slash history with Hilbert for a free Free month of premium membership. It's really worth checking out so do check it out because that does help out the channel as well and you can get access to all these great documentaries. But anyway, let's dive into it. Cuba has a long and interesting history. Starting already around 3000 BC, there are archaeological remains for tribes that moved over from what's now North and South America, moving onto the island, although these would largely be displaced by the end of the 15th century, mainly by a group of natives called the Tainos, who would chase out the others to the extreme western end of the island. Of course, life for these peoples would change drastically with the arrival of the Spanish already in 1492, when the north side of the island was explored by none other than Christopher Columbus on that first expedition after making landfall in the Bahamas. Over the subsequent centuries, Cuba was incorporated into the Spanish Empire as part of their holdings in the New World, and the islands changed drastically as a result. The local native population were largely displaced, many dying of disease, and were replaced both by Spanish immigrants and settlers, as well as African slaves who they needed for the large production of sugar. This would be a huge issue in Cuban history and later on as well, both this sugar production, which could make the island incredibly wealthy, and the slaves that were needed for it to carry on. As a result, poor Cubans of both European, African and mixed origin working on these sugar plantations would clamour for reform, being particularly inspired by the 1776 uprising of the colonies under the British in North America, becoming the United States, as well as the 1789 French Revolution, but particularly so for those of African descent, the 1791 Haitian Revolution, in which Haitian slaves took over from their French masters and declared themselves independent. There was a similar slave revolt in Cuba in 1795, but this ultimately failed. However, the French invasion of Spain during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century helped those in Cuba aiming to seek their own independence. However, in the end, they were not able to wrest control from Spain, as despite some liberalizing policies from the Spanish, by 1823, King Ferdinand VII had once again imposed absolutism, and this curtailed many of the freedoms in Cuba, although this would lead to, in the 1830s and 1840s, a greater increase in Cuban nationalism and calls for independence, whether these came from the richer Creole classes who wanted a race-based hierarchical system, or from the very bottom with black slave revolts, or something in between. Slave revolts in particular increased in intensity throughout the 19th century as the British, seeking to end slavery worldwide, pressured the Spanish into promising that they would eventually end slavery. These were dealt with increasingly brutal reprisals. However, it's in the second half of the 19th century that a real Cuban independence movement, especially among the wealthier planters, started to lead to what are termed wars rather than just rebellions against the Spanish authorities, starting in 1868 with the Ten Years' War, in which wealthy planters proclaimed an independent republic and fought for a decade against Spanish authorities, although they were finally defeated. Despite being defeated just a year later, as a consequence of unhappiness with the truce that was signed, another war broke out. This war would only last the year though, in 1879, and was known therefore as the Little War, 
and once again this ended in a Spanish military victory over the Cubans. The Spanish did begin to make some concessions however as in 1886 they finally banned slavery and this saw a great change in both the Cuban economy and society as many wealthy Cubans now had to join the middle classes and lost their sugar mills. However by 1895 the desire for independence had grown too strong and Cuban exiles in Latin America and largely from the United States set sail and still to claim their own independence, thus starting the Cuban War of Independence. This raged on for many years and they were actually very successful at fighting against the Spanish, claiming large parts of the island, including in the west, which was something that previous rebellions had failed to do. In 1898 as well, however, the United States was becoming increasingly pressured by public opinion and by various journalists and articles that were being written about the war there to get involved and to help the Cubans, as can be seen in this cartoon. This actually escalated much further when the USS Maine, which was a United States naval ship that was sent to La Havana to actually bring out the United States civilians that were caught up in the fighting, was sunk in the harbour. And this led to the American involvement in the war, which then changed the conflict to part of the Spanish-American War that was fought in various places. With the assistance of the Cuban rebels, the United States sent soldiers to the island and fought several battles against the Spanish, successfully defeating their Caribbean squadron at sea and then slowly grinding them down until Cuban independence had been won. However, the United States, as always, wasn't in this solely out of the goodness of their own hearts. And actually already in 1881, James Blaney, who was the US Secretary of State, had said about Cuba when it was still Spanish that that rich island, the key to the Gulf of Mexico is, though in the hands of Spain, a part of the American commercial system. If ever ceasing to be Spanish, Cuba must necessarily become American and not fall under any other European domination. This of course also implying that it should not truly be independent, but should be part of this American commercial system and should fall under their sway. And in 1896, actually, when the war had already been going on for two years before American involvement, Spain had actually offered to sell Cuba to the United States, although ultimately they turned this down. After Spain's surrender and the last of its troops had left the island in 1898, originally control went back to the Americans rather than to the Cubans, who said that they were safeguarding the democracy until the Cuban government could get on its own feet. However, during this time, it would soon become clear that actually the choice the Cubans had would have to be passed through the United States first, and that the United States was making sure during this period when it was control that Cuba would ultimately remain in its sphere of influence, largely through economic, but also through several social policies that they would be passing through. In 1902, for example, 40% of all the sugar production in Cuba would be owned by Americans, and this figure only increased throughout the first half of the 20th century. The 1902 Platt Amendment that actually sought to maintain the relationship between Cuba and the United States until at least 1934 lays out just how much control the Americans would have in Cuban affairs until that time. The various stipulations of the Platt Amendment meant that Cuba was left without a lot of its own independence in terms of foreign policy and in terms of its economy, not allowing, for example, the country to maintain any foreign debt without guarantees, as well as allowing the United States to intervene militarily, whether to preserve Cuban independence as well as the property and individual liberty, which actually a lot of the time meant that of the Americans who had invested in the the sugar industry and who were owning large parts of it, as well as having to cede several islands to the United States to control. The clause allowing American military intervention on the island was a particularly visible sign that the United States had actually in some ways simply replaced Spain as the new colonial master of the island as they militarily intervened for their own interests in 1906, 1912, and again in 1916. To this end, the Sergeant's Revolt of 1933 brought out of power a President Machado, who had actually already served his first term and who then carried on 
as a dictator for another year and was then ousted from power and this wave actually also sought to get rid of the Platt Amendment to abrogate it completely and so sought to diminish the influence of America in Cuba. However, in 1934 this was overthrown by a right-wing reaction against them. However, in 1940 would be the first election of Fulgencio Batista, who would become a very important figure for the story that unfolded. And he originally actually was supported by the Communist Party, although he certainly wasn't a communist himself, as he promised to stop them being outlawed as a party as they had been previously. Although rather soon the communists would stop supporting him completely as his true colours were revealed. As per the Cuban constitution he was not allowed to run for a second consecutive term in 1944 and so several presidents went between. However, by 1952 he stood for election again and was expected to win only a small minority. But they never actually got to the voting booth because he took over in a coup d'etat and declared himself president outside of the electoral process, thus becoming a new dictator on the Cuban scene. He was supported militarily by both the Americans as well as having many economic links across to the United States as well as by various figures in the Cuban and in the American mafia and the underground which he used to beat people into submission. He was largely supported financially and militarily by the United States with whom he sought closer relations and it's true that during his time about 70% of the land in Cuba was owned by largely Americans and other foreigners and the sugar industry was almost entirely owned by foreigners and not by Cubans themselves who suffered under Batista's regime which saw increased crackdown of press freedom and social liberties. Batista's regime was also markedly anti-communist as it was aligning with the United States and created a bureau for the investigation of communists within the country, using his links with the mafia as well as creating a secret police to kill those who were against his regime. It's at this point that we must introduce Fidel Castro, who was also standing in the 1952 election for the Partido Ortodoxo and who was a young lawyer at the time. When Batista's government took over and suspended the right to vote, Castro mounted a legal case against his government saying that it was unconstitutional to do so. However, the case was thrown out by the Cuban courts, which were firmly under Batista's sway. And so Fidel Castro decided that the only way to make a positive change in Cuba and to get rid of the new dictator was through military means. Together with his brother Raúl, he started what became known as El Movimiento, which is the movement, and gathered together supporters from the lower classes who were displeased with Batista's regime and started to train and to supply them with arms. Together with 16 and others, they attacked in 1953 the Moncada Barracks, which was a Cuban army barracks, although the attack went dreadfully as they were ill-prepared and the Cuban government soldiers made mincemeat of the attackers, killing many of them and imprisoning many more, including Raul and Fidel. During his court case, Fidel gave a very long speech in which he cited the reasons why he thought Batista's regime were unconstitutional and illegal and why his actions were justified, which which famously became known for the one phrase that he uttered which is la historia me absolverá which means history will absolve me nevertheless he and many others were sent to prison many of whom were later tortured and killed although raul and fidel both were saved in the end as despite the fact they'd been sent to prison for very long jail sentences in 1955 thanks to international pressure batista released all political prisoners from jails in cuba the Castro brothers went into exile in nearby Mexico and there endeavoured to create a better armed, better prepared guerrilla movement to take down the Batista regime as during this time in the mid 1950s there were increasing student protests and other guerrilla movements that were mobilising in the mountains but were still far too weak to directly take on the government. In 1956 for example another guerrilla group led an attack on the barracks at Domingo Goicuria although they too were defeated. Back in Mexico, Raúl and Fidel started a new group called the M26-7, which was the date of their fateful attack on the Moncada barracks. 
They were joined there by a young Argentine doctor called Ernesto Guevara, although he today is known more as by his nickname, which was Ernesto Che Guevara, or simply as Che Guevara. In Mexico, they drew to them other Cuban exiles as well as Latin American revolutionaries and prepared to mount a new guerrilla campaign. The Castro brothers and Che Guevara would make up part of 82 men who would sail aboard a yacht called the Granma, which, you know, that actually is Granma. It was an American ship that was repurposed in Mexico, and in 1956, they set sail for Cuba. Their plan was to reach the very south of Cuba and to infiltrate the mountainous region known as the Sierra Maestra, which was also a region that had been key for various Cuban revolutions and rebellions way back stretching into the 17th and 18th centuries, and from there mount an attack against the Batista regime, thus bringing on board the local population and ousting him from power. However, things went badly right from the start. It took them far longer to get there as actually only 12 men were meant to be crewing the ship and now it was full of 82 instead of the original number. And when they arrived, they were immediately ambushed by the soldiers of Batista and from an original 82 men, only about 20 survived from the beach landings and weren't hunted down immediately. And these surviving 20 men eventually reconvened in the mountains and had to make a start from there. They were not the only revolutionaries operating in Cuba at the time as in 1957 there were far larger groups that had caught the attention of the Batista government rather than this rather pitiful group of rebels in the very south. One of these was the DRE, or the Directorio Revolucionario Estudiantil, which was a group that was made up of students that wanted to overthrow the regime. And in 1957, they attacked the presidential palace in La Havana, the capital of Cuba, and sought to kill the president, although ultimately this ended simply in a bloody shootout in the capital and ended in bloody failure, as most of them were shot and the others imprisoned and later killed. A year later, the leader Frank Pais, who was another influential guerrilla serving in the countryside was also shot and killed and it seemed that the revolution was going very poorly indeed. His killing in the south of the country after a brutal policing campaign led to a general strike throughout Cuba which would then also see brutal repression by the government and lead to more fighting and violence sporadically throughout the country. This as well as the previous events caught the attention of the United States who until that time had been an ardent supporter of Batista's regime, supplying him with tanks, planes and napalm as well as intelligence which they were using against the rebels and would later be important for why many of these rebels saw this as a war not only against Batista's regime but against the United States as well. However, by 1958, it was becoming increasingly unpopular in the United States that they were supporting such a regime. Given the corruption and violence and brutality of Batista, many Americans wanted, instead of supporting the Batista regime, that the government started to support some of these rebel groups. And covertly, they started to, in fact, switch their support, starting an arms embargo against Batista and then supplying these rebel groups instead. A lot of this funding going to the M267 group, with the CIA being involved in gun running and basically getting arms and ammunition to the groups, which was something they desperately needed in their fight against the government army. There was even some like William Alexander Morgan who became known as El Yankee Comandante, which is the Yankee Commandant who served on the ground with other rebel groups. Although he was not a part of M267, he was part of a different group, the SFNE, which is El Segundo Frente Nacional del Escambre, who was serving in the mountains of Escambre further to the north in Cuba, which was another area of intense rebel activity, as well as the Sierra Maestra in the south, where Fidel and Raúl were busy fighting against the government forces. They were becoming increasingly successful at fighting against them for several reasons. They had trained in guerrilla tactics and had been fighting for quite a while, while the Cuban government, the army, especially after 1958 and the United States embargo, was suffering from shortages in arms and ammunition, as well as the fact that the CIA were now supplying the rebels with better arms and techniques to fight against them. The mounting victories against much larger numbers of the Cuban army forces and the subsequent Cuban repression against the local population also drove that population to supporting and aiding the rebels and turning the tide of the war against them. 
This led to the central administration and the army pursuing Operación Verano, which was a very large military offensive or known to the rebels as La Ofensiva, simply the offensive, in which 12,000 troops of the government went into the Sierra Maestra to flush out the M26-7 movement, which had just a few hundred fighters. However, time and again, the Cuban army soldiers were defeated by a much smaller number of rebels. However, they almost succeeded in wiping them out, as at one point, they were able to surround the rebel army completely and it looked like they were about to annihilate them. However, wily as always, Fidel Castro raised the white flag and pursued a truce for several days, saying that he would be willing to lay down his arms alongside his fellow rebels if his proposal was met. In reality, however, Fidel Castro was not at all interested in a truce and over the next three days while negotiations were going ahead he secretly pulled out his forces in small groups until they had melted into the undergrowth and his ploy had become clear. With the south now being firmly in rebel hands he started a grand offensive of his own aiming to capture the provinces of Holguin, Granma, Santiago de Cuba and Guantanamo. Although I should mention here that Granma is indeed named after the Yat and so at that time was not actually part of, was not actually the name of the province at the time. And I should also mention that it's pronounced Yat and not Yat as I keep saying. While Fidel was busy winning victories in the south in these four provinces as part of the new rebel offensive, he sent Che Guevara to the north with more brigades where they joined up with other rebel groups on the march to Santa Clara. However, this wasn't all smooth sailing as many of these groups that they encountered were ideologically quite different. Now, Che Guevara is known to be a socialist icon today, although there is a lot of debate as to how socialist or communist the M26-7 movement was in its entirety, as there certainly were communist elements there, although Fidel Castro's certain persuasion and, and political ideas is, as I say, subject to much debate that I should touch on at a later point. However, it can be said that many within M26-7 were indeed of a socialist persuasion, and this brought them into direct conflict with the DRE, which I'd mentioned earlier, this student group which was decidedly anti-communist. Nevertheless, they were still able to work together, and working as one, they were able to defeat Batista's forces at the crucial battle of Santa Clara, in which they ambushed an armored train and then defended the town, using actually a Sherman tank that they had captured as a part of their victory. Not very far away in La Habana, Fulgencio Batista heard the news that Santa Clara had fallen and that there were rebellions springing up around the country, decided to flee that day to the Dominican Republic. The Cuban army continued to fight, however, though by this time it became clear that they were doomed. In 1959, the commander Alexander Morgan captured Cienfuegos from the army in the north, and in the very south, Santiago de Cuba surrendered to Fidel Castro's forces. And and this really marked basically the end of the army's resistance as on the same day in the very north, Che Guevara and his forces entered the capital of La Habana and the peace was established really very soon after that. As the rebels celebrated and the ash began to settle, the United States waited nervously to see which side Castro would fall on given that it was the Cold War and given several of the communist elements within the M26-7. Initially, it seemed that Castro may well side with the United States, given that the United States had supported him somewhat with the CIA and the fact that he went and visited the United States beforehand and did not give off any impression that he would be joining the Soviet side of the Cold War. The debate about communism in Cuba is a very deep one, as it's not sure what exactly Fidel Castro's own political ideas were at this time. Indeed, he seemed to be more pro-United States at some points, although Che Guevara actually gives a very interesting insight into his mind and actually that even though many in America at that point, before all of the crises took off, thought that Fidel Castro was a great leader, Che Guevara actually mentioned of him that Fidel is not a communist. Politically, you can define Fidel and his movement as revolutionary nationalist. Of course, he is anti-American in the sense that Americans are anti-revolutionaries. And this is very interesting because Fidel had been a scholar of Cuban history and 
as I mentioned in the earlier parts of this video, the United States had been incredibly heavily involved in Cuban history already before the Spanish had given up the island and before that the Spanish. And so, as a nationalist, perhaps Fidel Castro was actually acting against the Americans not because he was particularly a communist, but because of their deep involvement in Cuba in the past. Of course, this is all said with the hindsight that the relationship between the United States and Cuba would become very sour indeed. In 1961, for example, the United States would intend to capture Cuba in the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was summarily defeated by the Cuban army, and thus the United States resorted to trying many, many times to have Fidel Castro assassinated. In 1962 as well, the Cuban Missile Crisis is one of the times that the world has come closest to bringing about its own destruction when Soviet missiles were sent to Cuba, although later on the relationship between Cuba and the Soviet Union is also very interesting because they also were not the most closely aligned and Cuba became one of those countries on the socialist spectrum that was called non-aligned because they weren't actually following the lead of Moscow as many others were or of Beijing as some other socialist or communist countries would later on. And I think that in large part again is possibly due to this history of Cuba of being dominated by outside forces like the Spanish and like the Americans and that Cuba was going to go its own way under Fidel Castro. This of course would carry on with the United States embargo against Cuba and these very frigid relationships between them that did start to thaw somewhat under Obama's regime as president, I say regime, I should probably use the word term, uh, as, as well in, in Donald Trump's regime what's interesting is that he actually started to roll back some of those steps towards more normal relationships that had existed under Obama and put a halt to what became known as the Cuban thaw which continues in 2021 this very very difficult relationship between Cuba and the United States but I think I'm going to leave this one here because this video is going on half an hour I've talked about an awful lot of Cuban history and the Cuban revolution as well as some of the speculation here there's a lot more to say about Cuba and its revolution, which I think is an incredibly interesting, incredibly difficult topic um, that isn't actually spoken about that much on YouTube, given its importance for the United States, where a lot of my viewers I know are from the United States and many people watching YouTube are, as well as the fact that you have this island in the Caribbean, which, as I said in the beginning, is not the place you'd sort of expect to find communism when you think of a kind of you know the old kind of cold factories and factory workers and social unrest in in a, in a frigid in a frigid north but of course this latin american history of communism is also very important uh, and to this day for many of them and especially in cuba as well as in historical terms anyway thank you very much for watching let me know if you have enjoyed this one and I'll think about perhaps doing some more on Cuba in the future. I do actually have another video coming out uh, as part of a new little series about an element of this video about the movement of M267 and a little bit more about them. But anyway, thank you very much for watching everyone. I hope you all have a great week. I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.